right, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to grab them and turn to Ezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to introduce you to Skeletor here in just a moment, all right? So good to be with you today, and we are entering our fall kickoff season here at the church. And next week, I want to encourage you to be back. We're going to be having a wonderful time of prayer for our coaches and teachers and administrators, uh, all of those who serve in our school system. We're going to begin a new preaching series uh, out of the book of Daniel. We're going to look at the first six chapters of the book of Daniel uh, here to begin the fall. I've been studying all summer and locked and loaded for that series. Really excited about that. And also, just by way of introduction to you this morning, I want to encourage you that if you're interested in being involved in any volunteer leadership here at our church this afternoon at 430, we have our summit leadership training. Uh, we already have over 1,200 uh, lay leaders signed up. We want you to come, uh, but we need to know that you're coming. You can text SUMMIT to 77069. Uh, but at 4.30, we'd love for you to be here as we explore ways to serve in our church, talk about the importance of serving, and it gives us an opportunity to thank all of you uh, who are involved in the life and ministry of our church. Our fall kickoff season is so important uh, as a church because it's an opportunity for us to get on the same page. And with new seasons, there's always new hopes of reaching new people, beginning new ministries, and starting new initiatives. And I don't know about you, but I love uh, new seasons of life and ministry. Uh, I, I know we're getting ready to go into the fall, and with that is the hope of cooler weather. Can I get a witness, all right? And so it's going to be another month or two for us here in Houston, but don't you look forward to it not being 100, more like 91 to 92. That'll be a wonderful time. Uh, just the hope of that new season. It's a new season of change and transition as many of us are preparing to take our children to college and drop them off for the first time. And while it's sad in many ways, it's also fun and exciting. Again, a chance to make new friends, new opportunities uh, for growth, new experiences to move forward. Uh, any type of new season brings hope. We've got a new football season coming up. All you Aggies are hoping. <laughs> Ain't nobody care about that, all right? Then you got... <laughs> You got Texas and Oklahoma entering the SEC for the first time, all right? They're excited. You got Sikkim Bears and Guns Up, Red Raiders, all right? The fall football season brings all sorts of hopes. We got our Astros. We're hoping they continue this run. And we're hoping that this is the Texans' year to shine. Hope is a good thing. And today, uh, before we Go into the book of Daniel. I thought this standalone message is one that I've wanted to preach for a while. I thought we'd give a message of hope. Uh, it's been said that man can live 40 days without food, about three days without water, and four minutes without air, but we cannot live for four seconds without hope. Now, helping me preach this message today is my friend Skeletor here. And just his presence on stage, all right, is probably going to communicate louder and more effectively than anything I may have to say today. If you're taking notes, the title of the message is called Coming to Life, Ezekiel chapter 37. The picture we see painted for us in this text was given to the nation of Israel at a time and season of their existence when they were the most hopeless. You may be here today and you've fallen on hard times, but just listen to what Israel was going through. At the time that Ezekiel 37 was written, their nation had been ransacked, their ability to worship in the temple, that was over. It had been destroyed by the Babylonians. They had lost their land, their holy city, Jerusalem, had been desecrated. There were false prophets in the land making false predictions. Their freedom had been taken away and they had been taken in to exile. They were a people in slavery, in captivity. They were hopeless, they were helpless. A people of deep despair. They were rejected and dejected. And, and as a matter of fact, a collective communal sense of hopelessness was expressed if you look at it, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11, the third part of that verse, 
They said as a community, our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. I wonder, have you ever felt this way before? Like you don't feel like you're holding on necessarily. You feel like you've already let go. Hope is nowhere to be found in your life. The door's been shut. It's a lonely time. Whatever it is you're facing or walking through, you're here today, you're breathing in air, but if truth was told, you feel dead on the inside. It's a sense of hopelessness and desperation. Since that the lights have been turned off, the ship has sailed, that door that you thought was open is now closed and the, it's locked and the key thrown away. Anybody know what I'm talking about here today? You sensed that before, felt that before, maybe you're in it now. And the question we're answering today is can that which is dead, that relationship, that career, that dream that you thought God had put in your heart, can a nation, a church, a spiritual life, can that which is dead be brought back to life? And if so, how? Now I mentioned I've wanted to preach this passage since I got here at Champion Forest and just haven't found a good weekend to do it, knowing I had a standalone weekend going into the fall. This is a text that preachers throughout history have used for revival and awakening, and you'll see why here in just a moment. It's a powerful passage of Scripture and one that I'm eager to hope to shed a little bit of light on today. I want us to look at it together, Ezekiel chapter 37, starting in verse 1. The Bible says this, the hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them and behold, there were many and on the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. Since we're talking about death and life, I figured the best way to outline this passage today was to outline it in medical terms. And so I wanna begin with first what we see is a diagnosis, and that diagnosis is death. This is the problem. God comes to the prophet Ezekiel, and he gives him, takes him on a journey. Now, scholars debate whether this was an actual, literal valley that God takes Ezekiel to. Was it the site of an actual battle in the history of Israel? Or is this just a vision that God has given him? It really doesn't matter which view you take. What's important is that you see and take note of what Ezekiel is surrounded by. And the writer here goes into great detail. There is death. There is decay. This is what these bones represent. They are relics of life. Ezekiel is in the middle of a valley, and all he sees is skeletons, bones. Notice the detail. Verse 2 says these bones are very dry. Ezekiel is in the middle of the valley, verse 1, and God takes him all around among them so that all Ezekiel sees is death on every side. And this is, this was the state of the nation of Israel at the time. They were nothing but dead bones. There was no life in them. And God makes this clear to the prophet Ezekiel. This is what he sees. Look at it, Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 11. And then he, God said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. God wants Ezekiel to see in an up close and personal way, the death of his people. Now the question becomes, how did this death come about? And Ezekiel knows the exact reason because he spent much of his life in ministry preaching to the people of Israel, telling them to turn from their sin, turn from their rebellion. He knows exactly the reason they are in exile and exactly the reason God is calling and seeing Israel as dead bones. He knows this because sin always brings about two things, judgment and death. 
Just look at the sin Ezekiel preached against. Turn one chapter back to Ezekiel 36 and read, look with me at verses 16 through 21. Now warning here, this is extremely graphic. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like the uncleanness of a woman in her menstrual impurity. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols which with they had defiled it. I scattered them among the nations and they were dispersed through the countries in accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name in that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord and yet they had to go out of his land but I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations to which they came. Simply put, Israel was dead, dry bones, because of their sin. They were dead, dry bones because God will not be mocked. Israel was reaping what they had sown. They had chosen to rebel against God. They had chosen to worship foreign gods, bow down to foreign idols. They aligned themselves with people who did not honor God. And they chose to profane his name, even living in a constant state of pride and rebellion. And so God says judgment and sin, judgment and death, bones you become. You need to hear this today, it's a major takeaway from this sermon. If you're taking notes, write it down. God judges sin. He did then and he does now. His love and his judgment are two sides of the same coin. You cannot have one without the other. And in the nation of Israel's case, God had had enough. He sent them into exile. That didn't lead to their repentance. Instead, they continued to profane his name. And so God says, ultimately, death. Bones you become. Ezekiel, Israel is nothing but skeletons. They don't know me. They don't honor me. They're not in a relationship with me. And what's even more sad than that is they don't even know it. Now we could camp out on that all morning long. You know, it's true. In a room this size, people watching online, there are people here today. You've got flesh on and you are taking in oxygen. You are living. But the fact is, you're not in a relationship with the Lord. And if God could remove our, uh, the veil from our eyes and allow us to see spiritually, you are skeletons sitting out here. There's some here, skeletons. You got flesh, you're taking in air, but you are dead spiritually. Come to church, may even be a good moral person, but there's no life in you. If you don't know Jesus as personal Lord and Savior of your life, who by the way, came to take your judgment and sin, experience your death, you don't know Jesus dead spiritually. Others, what God wants from us today, if you're a Christian and you're in a relationship with Jesus, he wants to unveil our eyes and allow us to see the dead, dry bones that are indeed all around us. He wants to show us what he showed Ezekiel. I mean, when you go to lunch today and you have a waiter or waitress waiting at your table, if they don't know Jesus, skeletons. When you're around your table today, you've got family members that you know and that you love, but they're not in a relationship with Jesus. God wants you to see what Ezekiel sees and see that person as a skeleton. When you go to the office tomorrow, 
That person that you work with, cubicles up next to you, offices next to you. If they don't know Jesus, skeletons. You go to school, students, and you're interacting and you're in your activities and you're in your sporting events, whatever it is you may be participating in. There's somebody that lockers up next to you. If they don't know Jesus, God wants you to see the reality today. What he sees is they are dead, dry bones. God, give us eyes to see what you see. This is what sin eventually always leads to. Death, dead, dry bones. I was thinking about dryness and football season coming up. I remember when I used to play in high school, it'd be so hot, two a days are here. I uh, mean, those kids that are playing football, they're out there early in the morning so they can beat the heat. And it's, 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 it's horrible out there, so hot. And I remember my mouth would get so dry, we used to call it cotton mouth. Because it's like you were eating a ball of cotton, I'd be dying for a water break. Coaches weren't giving me any, all right, because they didn't love Jesus, weren't in a relationship with Jesus. <laughs> And I remember I'd take my undershirt, man, that would be soaking with sweat, and I'd just put it in my mouth just to wet my mouth a little bit, cotton mouth. Listen, it's possible to have cotton mouth in your marriage. It's dry. You haven't kept those embers of love and faithfulness going, and your marriage can get dry, just like these dry bones. We can get dry spiritually. I mean, we can be believers, but get out of our time alone with the Lord. Get out of our regular attendance and being with believers. And what happens is we can get cotton mouth spiritually. We can get dry spiritually. As a nation, let's not fool ourselves. We're just as dead as the nation of Israel in Ezekiel's time. We too have aligned with other gods, pursued idols of every kind. We have profaned God's name. And get this, we'll talk about this in our Daniel series. Elections are coming up and they're important. No question about it. Elections are important. But elections can't make that which is dead come to life. Elections can't fix dead, dry bones. So look around, champion force. Ask God to allow you to see what he sees. And what he sees, people who aren't in a relationship with him, not walking with him, dead, dry bones all the way around. The diagnosis is death. So what's the prognosis? If the death is, if the diagnosis is death, where do we go from here? I mean, some of you are thinking, Pastor Jerry, you said this was a message of hope. But we get our first glimpse right here in the prognosis. The diagnosis is death, the prognosis is life. Now on the surface, this doesn't make any sense at all. The dead coming back to life, come on, that doesn't happen. Seems a little too far-fetched even for the prophet Ezekiel to buy into. He's asked by God, look at it in Ezekiel chapter 37, verse three. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, you know. In other words, Ezekiel says, Lord, please don't ask me this right now. He's in a valley surrounded by skeletons everywhere. And God asked him, can these bones live again? I mean, he's discouraged, he's depressed. This is his nation, this is the people that he loves. Bones don't come back to life. But he's not gonna say that to the all-powerful God of the universe who creates everything out of nothing. So look at what he does. He musters up the strength and creativity to come up with one of the best non-answers of all time says, God, you know, I feel for Ezekiel here. He doesn't want to say, yes, God, these bones can live again. And God give him a lesson and say, no, they can't. Now he spins into more depression. But he also doesn't want to say, yes, God, they can. Or no, they can't. And exhibit a lack of faith. And a God who can do anything is having a hard time, Ezekiel is seeing anything other than what's right in front of him. How can 
good and life come from something as so bad as death. I get what Ezekiel's feeling here. It's hard sometimes. When you're in a situation that seems hopeless, that door is closed, that ship is sailed, those lights have been turned out, it's hard to believe that God can do the impossible when you're staring at something that seems so dry and dead and screams the opposite of what you believe in your heart God can do. Life in the midst of dry bones, it seems inconceivable. I mean, you're in a marriage that's on the rocks. You've got one partner that won't come to the table, refuses to forgive, won't communicate, discuss the root issues causing the problems. Seems inconceivable that that dead marriage can be brought back to life. That person that you shared Jesus with, that family member, you've been through it, you've, you've shared with them the gospel, you've showed them the love of Jesus. And they're still antagonistic toward God and his love. It seems inconceivable that that person would ever come to know Jesus Christ. That kid on the team always mocking the things of God, living it up. No way would they come to know Jesus. It seems inconceivable that they could come to know Christ. Seems inconceivable where we are as a country that God could in a moment start a third great awakening in our nation. Bringing dead things back to life seems inconceivable. On the surface, it doesn't even make sense that it could be a possibility. But we know the God that we serve, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, what is impossible with man is possible with God. All things are possible. You hearing me today? All things are possible with God, including bringing that which is dead back to life. In fact, resurrection is what Jesus specializes in. You look at his life and ministry. Every funeral he came to, he interrupted, he broke up whether it was raising the only son of a widowed woman in Luke chapter seven, or raising the young daughter of the synagogue ruler named Jairus, raising her from the dead in Mark chapter five, or raising Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11, or even Jesus' own resurrection, our God specializes in bringing that which is dead back to life. You can count on it. You can believe in it. This is what he does. Jesus confirming his authority as the son of God. Listen to what the scripture says in John chapter five, verse 21. For as the father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the son gives life to whom he will. Paul making his defense before Agrippa in Acts chapter 26, verse eight. He said, why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? This is what God does. He raises up those who are dead spiritually and he brings them to life. He can raise a dead marriage or a relationship and he can bring it back to life. He can raise dead dreams and hopes and aspirations. He can raise to life dead churches. He's promised that one day he will raise everyone who has put their faith in him. This is what he does. If something is dead in your life, don't despair. Because this is where God does his best work. But in order for resurrection to occur, we're putting this outline today in medical terms. The diagnosis is death. The prognosis is life. But in order for resurrection and life to occur, you've gotta make sure that you follow God's treatment plan. Isn't this what happens when we go to the doctor? We get a diagnosis, this is what's wrong with you. We get a prognosis, this is what your future's gonna look like, and then they put you on a treatment plan. 
Well, what is God's treatment plan? What is his prescription, if you will, for life, for revival, for awakening, for resurrection? The prescription is his word and his spirit. This is how God brings the dead back to life. It is the special ingredients to this concoction called revival. I've told you before, I get migraines and my doctor, I've got a special concoction. I take with me everywhere I go. I start to get a migraine. I take that little concoction. If I catch it in time, that migraine goes away. It's a beautiful thing. Well, here is the prescription, the concoction of resurrection, to awakening, to revival, to coming back to life. It's the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Look at verses four through six of Ezekiel chapter 37. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live and I will lay sinews upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. Look at it again in verse four, underline it. Hear the word of the Lord. That word hear there, it means to listen intelligently. In other words, As you give yourself to God's word, as you hear the word proclaimed over you, you're listening intelligently. You want life? He's saying, lean in. Take this word like it's a a, a life jacket to someone drowning and you hold to it, you cling to it. Life does not happen. It does not occur by just coming in, listening to the word of God and it going in one ear and out the other. You can listen to podcasts all week long. Life doesn't happen by simply opening up God's word and giving it a casual run through as if you're doing God a favor. No, the hearing of the word that is talked about here is someone who takes it in for all that it's worth, holds tight to it. This is one of the reasons it's so important to be in church every single week, to be a part of a life group ministry, to make sure the word of God is being spoken over you. We're gonna talk tonight at Summit about the importance of an invite. Why is that so important? Look at it right here in verse four. Prophesy the word of God over dead, dry bones. This word prophesy here, it's akin to the word preaching. It means to speak forth. It means to declare. See, what what dead people need, what people who are spiritually dry need, they don't need a self-help plan that's going to teach them to manage their time better. Dead people, dry bones, what they don't need is a substance of some kind to escape their reality. What dead people, what they don't need is a physical makeover that's gonna make them feel good about themselves on the outside. They don't need a list of to-dos that if they can just check them off the list, they'll be a better, more moral person. Dead people don't need these things. You know what dead people need? They need someone skilled in the word of God that can take it and speak it over their life. That's what dead people need. They need the word of God. That's what they gotta have. That's why coming here is so very important. Again, it's not just me, it's your life group leaders. That's why you got life group leaders, you gotta be trained in the word. It's why Christians, it's so important that you wake up and you spend time alone with the Lord every single day in his word because what dead people need at your school and office and neighborhood, what they need is you skilled in the word of God, knowing the word of God so that when you communicate, you can speak it over their life. That's what dead people need. There's a reason the scripture says your word in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 29, your word is a hammer that breaks a hard rock into pieces. Sharper, Hebrews chapter four, verse 12, did a two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and mirror, discerning the thoughts and intentions of all. I've told you before, I believe I could get up here on a Sunday morning and just read God's word, word for word, and somebody's getting saved. Somebody dead's coming back to life. That's the power of the word of God. We're starting, we're starting in a few weeks, our midweek ministry back. And I really encourage you to be a part of our midweek ministry. You text midweek to 77069. We've got classes that you can go to. And we've been talking about as a staff for the last few years, 
of really wanting to be a place of healing for broken people. Like we want that so bad as a church. We want this to be a place where when someone knows that their life is jacked up, I can go to that place and I'm gonna find the love of Christ, I'm gonna find the healing that I'm looking for. We've been praying for that. Now, there's elements that's been going on for years here at Champion Force, like our grief share ministry and our divorce care ministry, finding a path to financial freedom. All these classes are on Wednesday night, starts August the 28th, but we've got a new one starting up in August that we wanna make you aware of today and you can go out to our commons area and learn more about it, but it's called Hurts, Habits, and Hangups. And it's basically a eight week class, kind of the infant stages of celebrate recovery, if you will. Oftentimes we think of recovery and the three big things, right? Pornography and alcohol and drug abuse, but it can be anything. People pleasing, control, lack of control, be any, any habit, any hurt, any hang up that is preventing you from walking in freedom with Christ, this class is gonna help. And we've got all these classes that we're gonna offer on midweek, merge and re-engage for, for couples who wanna renew their marriage and grow stronger in their marriage. But here's the thing about all of these classes. It's not, it's not coming to the class that's gonna just help you. You know why coming to the class is gonna help you? Because all of these classes, what, what it's gonna do is it's gonna take the word of God and it's gonna speak it over your life. And the power is in the word of God. If you want resurrection, if you want awakening, if you want revival, fundamentally it begins with God's word. But that's not all it takes. The word of God is necessary and fundamental, but God's prescription it takes the Word of God and the Spirit of God. Look at it there in verse 7 of Ezekiel 37. <clears throat> so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound. Just picture it, man. Put yourself in that valley with Ezekiel. The Word of God's being prophesied, and behold, a rattling. And bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them. Now they've gone from being skeletons to corpses. But there was no breath in them. That word breath there is the Hebrew word ruach. It means wind. Spirit, same word used in Genesis chapter two, verse seven, where God creates Adam, the man, but he did not become a living being until he ruached, breathed into him life. Verse nine, these skeletons, these corpses, there's no life till God said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Come on. The word of God and the spirit of God led to their being an exceedingly great army. What do dead, dry, spiritually people need? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. What do dead marriages and broken relationships need? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. What do dead, lifeless churches need? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. What does a dead nation need? The Word of God and the Spirit of God. If you need hope today, you need hope, look no further than the God who brings the dead back to life. And you want proof that he can do this? Some of you are listening to me in that situation. You say, Jerry, you don't know how dead it is. You want proof in black and white that God can do exactly what he's talking about here? Let me, let me show you proof. Look at verse 11 through 14, and we'll close this message out looking at this passage. Then he said to me, son of man, 
These bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. Indeed, we are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. Look at this. And I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it, declares the Lord. God gave Ezekiel a promise. Here's how you know God can bring that which is dead back to life. God gave Ezekiel a promise that one day the dead bones of Israel would be raised up and that they would come out of their grave in verse 12, be brought back into their land. You do know that Israel was kicked out of their land for 2,000 years. And then on May the 14th, 1948, dead dry bones The nation of Israel was reestablished and we saw a regathering of people coming back to Israel. And so when you look at the people of Israel, you see that dead dry bones can come up out of the grave. But watch this, they're still corpses if they don't believe in Jesus. And so when we look at verse 14, it speaks of the reign of Christ, that I will put my spirit in them. And we know scripture teaches that before Jesus returns, there will be a great conversion of Jewish people that come to know Christ. And the spirit of the living God will go into these corpses and they will become living beings. And if you talk to people, there are more Jews coming to know Christ than ever before, meaning this, that God comes true on his word. Dry bones will, they are living again. And you better believe that what God is doing, he will continue to do. And every time someone comes to know Jesus in a personal way, it is proof positive that God raises the dead back to life. So if you're feeling a bit hopeless today in despair, dry bones all around, there's hope. Because the Word of God combined with the Spirit of God always leads to resurrection, revival, awakening, and life. Amen? Thanks so much for watching. We pray you've been encouraged and challenged. At Champion Force, we focus on advancing the kingdom of God by making disciples, loving our community, and strengthening the church. We are passionate about all kinds of people coming to know God and growing in their relationship with Him. We would love the opportunity to talk and pray with you. To connect with us, just go to championforce.org slash connect. Of course, we can't wait to welcome you in person at one of our three locations in the near future. For campus-specific times and details, just visit our website at championforce.org. We'll see you very soon.